Yeah, so I'm going to talk some about uh, Gravano homology this afternoon. And uh, everything I say is, is joint work with, uh, with Kevin Walker. And in some sense, this is sort of a, a historical talk, uh, uh, in the sense that I'm going to try and explain to you how we have been thinking about Gravano homology and trying to get it into the sort of shape where you can extract four manifold invariants from Gravano homology using a, a, a TQFT setup. But then, by the end, I want to explain how uh, we realized that the, the sort of the old-fashioned TQFT setup was actually really insufficient for, for working with Gravano homology, and how this led us to, to thinking about this thing that, that we call the Bob complex, uh, but is very closely related to uh, the things in, in Blurry's work, and, and as I was talking to Peter earlier today, I mean, we, we really need to aspire to, to see it as being an aspect of his work somehow. Uh, so we'll get there. So let me um, speak a little bit about Kravano homology at the beginning. Um, you had a, had a, a great overview of Kravano homology from the inside, from draw this morning, how you actually write it down and compute it, and then the actual definition of the construction. But I want to talk about it here just sort of from the outside. I want to tell you what sort of thing Kravano homology is, and tell you list the, the, the properties that we're going to use. And um, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how we get to a TQRT. So Kravano homology is a gag here that associates Okay, 
Now, as Drewer also explained in his talk, there's an extinction to tangles. So, uh, KFT is some complex in, uh, in some category that I'll write BN. Conveniently, it's someone's initials. And so here, uh, I think when T, the tangle, has n boundary points, because there are different categories here depending on what size boundary you're looking at, and you get a different complex in that category for each different tangle. And uh, in V0, that, that category is just vector spaces, which covers that original invariant complex. So there are no boundary points, we just get some complex of vector spaces. say about the, this extension to tangles is that it lets you do computations. So when T is some, uh, is some union of, of two smaller tangles, it's all about to connect some symbol here. So I'm, I mean, I'm going up some subset of the boundary points of T1 with some subset of the boundary points of T2. Possibly there's still other boundaries sitting around on both sides. But when you build a tangle out of two smaller pieces, uh, we can compute. From the the small pieces. And this is what Draw was describing to you when he said that there's a sort of divide and conquer algorithm to working out the runoff molecule of a tangle, successfully adding one, one more crossing, simplifying the, uh, the, the anti dead at each stage, and then adding another crossing, simplifying the okay. Could you remind me what the objects in the end are? So the objects in Vn are basically temporary lead diagrams. So, so one manifolds and a disk, some arcs and some circles. Uh, the morphisms in Vn are these abstract cobordisms between those, modular all these local relations. And maybe you need to, I mean, you need to allow formal direct sums and some other things like that. But yeah, one manifold is an abstract cobordism between the modulus and strength local relations. Okay. Um, but I don't really want to say we need all that. I mean, we sort of expect that Kurvana homology categorifying the Jones polynomial has a whole lot of analogs for lots of other quantum invariants. And everything I've written down here, I mean, some slight variation of it should hold for all of those other ones. And perhaps everything that I'm going to say later will, 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 will eventually work for all of the other uh, analogs of Kurvana homology for other quantum numbers. OK. So what does all of that add up to? Well, to Kuvana homology is, is very intrinsically a, a four-dimensional gap. Uh, you can see here, I mean, it associates something to, uh, to surfaces in, in the four space, to cobordisms with new links. And you can even see the sort of uh, the four directions in which you can compose the stuff involved in Kuvana homology. First of all, uh, we can stack cobordisms on top of each other, and we just compose the resulting chain maps. But there's also three directions worth of compositions here. You can put tangle, and tangles are three-dimensional things, and you can glue them together in all three directions. And there are operations in complexes in Vn telling you how to assemble this out of the, the algebraic data here. So it's, so it's four-dimensional. Can you understand four manifolds? Uh, uh, 
the Gordian hypothesis basically says that TQ of T is corresponding to the right sort of four categories, and so we just consider, in fact, all that right sort of four category directly from the heart. So, um, we'll build uh, a dislike for So this is really outside the world of uh, really strictly the and hypothesis. I mean, well, at the moment, it's outside that world. And, and so this, it's not that we can really follow along exactly there. But I'll show you how, I'll show you the definition of a display category, and I'll show you how to build manifold invariants directly from it. Uh, and it, it's meant to be very similar to what's going on in the Kerbois picture. So once we have a display four category, we then immediately have a TQRT invariant. Now that TQRT invariant associates a vector space to each form manifold. So for now, we'll just write this cage of the form manifold. Uh, possibly, actually, depending on a little bit more data, you could write a, a link, if you like, in the boundary of that form manifold if the boundary is not empty. And we're going to be associating a vector space to that pair, form manifold, and a link in the boundary. Um, and it generalizes to one homology. Above, in the following sense that uh, the Kravana homology, the four manifold invariant Kravana homology of the four with a link in the boundary tree sphere, well, this vector space is just the usual fashion. Okay? But the idea is we're going to define something for, for all other forms of this. Okay. So let's, let's pause on, uh, on Kravana homology for a little while. And I just want to talk about the generalities of, of our notion of a disk-like in category and how we build uh, TQFT invariants from a disk-like in So 
you might have uh, seen different versions of, of atomicizations of two categories, where in the diagrams you, you think of your two morphisms as sitting in little, as being little bible shaped things. Or maybe in other atomicizations you might have seen uh, two morphisms that look sort of like squares. And if, you, if you've read lots of different definitions of higher categories, you'll realize that many of the different definitions uh, have a sort of shape uh, in mind that controls all the different composition operations in the end category. And we're just going crazy here. We're just saying, no, 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 any shape that is a ball, anything that's abstractly isomorphic to, to a cable, we're going to have some set of morphisms of that shape. OK. So that's the first bit of, of data. The second is uh, restriction maps. Give me some k morphism of shape x, and you tell me that y, so here y is a is a sub ball of the boundary of x, so it's one dimension down. Okay, I should be able to take this morphism on x and restrict it to be a morphism on on, on y. Okay, so in particular now, if you have some ball and you have in mind the splitting of its boundary into the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere then I will tell you what the source and target of the morphism was. But until you choose the splitting of the boundary, the morphism doesn't have a source and target. It's just some, something sitting on X. And this is, this is part of where the, all of the, this is where the pivotality is built in. Morphisms don't come with sources and targets. Uh, but if, you were, if you're willing to provide this composition of the boundary, I can tell them to you. Another way to think about where the pivotality comes in here, homeomorphisms act on balls here. So if I look at the set of homeomorphisms on some specific ball, all the ways to rotate that ball into itself give me give me automorphisms of its set. So I, can, I, I have a notion of taking a, a k morphism and turning it upside down in all the different ways that you can turn k balls upside down. So that, that's all built in. Okay, and um, finally, well, the <coughs> room maps. So say I have uh, some ball which looks like two balls glued together along some codimension one ball. So here I've got two k balls and a k minus one ball. Then uh, the gluing maps provide maps from the morphisms on x1 across the morphisms on x2 to the morphisms on x1 union x2, but only on the fiber plane. So here I'm going to write C A minus 1 of Y. So what this means is a morphism on X1, which restricts to some specific morphism on, on Y, and some other morphism here that restricts to that same K minus 1 morphism on Y. This is, so this fiber product condition is just saying it makes sense to compose these. And if it makes sense to compose them because they agree on a different boundary, you can group the morphisms together and get morphisms. Okay. This is for any choice of Y. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, however you want to assemble the two balls. Okay, there's a few other bits of data to do with identities. Uh, um, but I'm, oh, those, are the, those are the main three bits of data that we need, we need to display. Okay. So what does it all satisfy? So what does that data up there have to satisfy? Maybe I'll continue on this side. Well, at level N, that is the, the topmost level, asotopic homeomorphisms Same map over on, on the set of endmorphisms. Isotopic homeomorphisms act identically. Okay. 
And this axiom here is really just capturing all the non fills for all the sort of coherence axioms between all the different compositions that you could possibly uh, put it. Uh, it's, it's a very sort of uh, terse axiom um, that, that captures a lot and is very strong, but of course uh, it means that maybe there's a lot of effort in checking any given example. Any proposed example really satisfies these axioms. Oh, and the other really important axiom here is that the gluing maps are strictly associated. That is, if you glue three balls together uh, in, in, in different orders, you, uh, you end up with the same morphism on, on the big blue double. Now, this might seem a little strange because everyone knows that we're meant to not be strict about things and that good end categories are, are, uh, are weak end categories. But that, that's still what's going on here. I mean, the, the gluing maps here are strictly associative. But of course, if you have, uh, um, say, some morphisms on some small balls, when you glue them together, you get some morphism on some big ball. And if you want to, uh, um, and you, you uh, you have to pick some some uh, some homeomorphism of that big ball back to your standard ball if you if you want to make comparisons like that. And as soon as you do, as soon as you make those choices, everything stops being associated. Uh, sorry, maybe I should be more explicit about that. So. Oh, well, maybe maybe I'll leave it. This seems a little strange at first, but, but uh, it's, it's the right. Okay. Can you explain? Um, uh, no? <laughs> I, uh, no, I don't have any simplicial sets in mind associated with this. Okay, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of examples in just a moment. Um, but before I show you some examples, let me tell you very, very quickly what one does with a disk like in category. From the disk like in category, you immediately get vector space invariants of in Okay, so we have this, this, this process of ways of writing M as a 
as, a, as a glue into the other balls. Now, the N category, the N category gives a function. From this person, into set. So what is this? Well, we look at some object in person it, that's some way of dropping it up into balls. And all that we do is we take the Cartesian product of all the morphisms of this shape, with the morphisms of this shape, with the morphisms of this shape, with the morphisms of this shape. Except we don't take the entire Cartesian product. We just take a finite product, fibering, fibering over all the conditions that if we look at our morphism here and we it to that little uh, k minus or n minus one ball there, it's got to give the same answer as restricting the morphism we on this n ball to the same minus one ball that's not going to come down. Okay? So it's just a, a collection of n morphisms on all of our balls uh, that, that meet up with them. Okay? And so that tells you what the function is on objects, you decomposition, we just get some, some set there. And the, the maps here, what we can map here is just some coarsening, pulling a bunch of balls together into a bigger ball. And these gluing maps here give us exactly the maps. The TQFT invariant uh, let me see the TQFT scan module to make sure that we're thinking about this is, these aren't numerical TQFT invariants, these are like vector space set by the TQFT invariants. The TQFT scan module is called that A for these sort of things. I think that it's sort of pairing an N-manifold with the N category. And all that it is is the cooling along this process of that functor. So I'm using the notation here and C here and, and just writing it in this functor. So what on earth is this, this definition here? Well, a representative of this cooling is just pick some point in this in this process and provide all the all the requisite data and then more money for. But uh, there are relations between those representatives. Uh, if you could obtain that collection of endomorphisms on this ball decomposition by gluing together some, uh, some morphisms on some final ball decomposition, then you declare that those two are the same, those two representatives are the same in the code. That's all the code means. Okay? So you just identify any, any point, any value here in the team that we're at. Okay. So that's a very, very terse and fast description of how we get from an n-category to an invariant of n-manifolds. So maybe it's time uh, to get some examples, uh, which will be much more familiar to those of you. So maybe, uh, let me do Yes. So, call it, call it is not a set or a multiple. Um, yeah, yeah. So, in, in this setup, it's just a set. So, let, let me let me uh, digress here and explain uh, where the vector space is coming. Um, nearly always, we want to think about. Uh, oh, we need to leave this convenient position right there. Okay. Um, so, this is what an n category, just like n category was, uh, where we just had sets of morphisms everywhere. But usually, we want to talk about linear categories. And so what I want to do to talk about linear categories is I want to say, well, for each, K, for each n ball, we're only going to do this at the top level. There are only going to be vector spaces at, at level n. So fix some n ball, and you get some giant set of all the morphisms on that. What I want to say is that that set breaks up into whole subsets according to the boundary restriction maps. So each one of those smaller sets will be a bunch of morphisms that have exactly the same boundary restriction maps on them all over their boundary. And each of those subsets should have the structure of a vector space, if you want to have a linear n category. So that's just saying that any time you have two n morphisms, which uh, have all the same boundary restrictions, you should be able to add all the other Okay? So this is, this is really, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible definition in some sense of how to of, of a linear n category, because whatever I wanted to enrich in, whatever I wanted my n morphisms to form, had to have an un underlying set in this definition to make any sense. And that's, that's a bit unpleasant, but that's the best we can do. 
Oh. So roughly any morphisms with the same downward conditions have the structure of a vector space. And then you ask all these other things, all these other bits of data, you spread that linear structure, and then you see at the end of the day that this code of things are vector space. Certainly tempting to, to say, well, yeah, we should just use balls with, with whatever sort of geometry you want around. And if you're, I mean, you, you probably, well, well I think you, are, you must want to keep something something of that axiom. But, but, but even if they're chain complexes, you don't want that axiom, right? That's true. Well, 
this definition is sort of obviously invariant. We, we never made any choices up here, or at least uh, we did make choices of all the compositions and we washed them back out by taking the curve. We didn't need to pick any hand in the composition of the manifold or anything like that. We just, we just obviously get a well-defined vector space. And then it's a then you have to check that, that thing that you get can be built using the So Tell me if I'm wrong. The coordinate set of two vector spaces is usually not their vector space. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're reaching somewhere else, you need to take coordinates in the, in the appropriate place. And uh, the, you have this function already, you, you, you work in, you build the function of vector spaces. Um, the, when, it, when, you, when you take that final product, you have to replace that with a tensor product over the. Okay. Uh, so to arrive there are at least the two arrive there are vector spaces and surfaces, maybe not I'm not saying anything about the numerical grants of three but just with vector spaces. This just comes right from there. Um, if C is a modular tensor category, uh, we can think of it. As, uh, as a display three category, and uh, the same module for a three manifold is the vector to continue on invariant. There's a kind of dimension shift here of the bound. Usually, the way we think about measure taking to rad is that it associates vector spaces to two manifolds and numbers to three manifolds. But here, our natural setup associates vector spaces to three manifolds. Uh, but it turns out that in the case where your input category is modular, these vector spaces depend very, very weakly on the interior of the M. And uh, essentially, they depend on, on the, the, the boundary and maybe a little bit of extra data, like a frame. Okay. Could you discuss a little bit how you do this? How you, you see that that's what you get? Um, um, and how do you define this like three categories? Oh, from a modular tensor category? Oh, okay. So the, um, yeah, so let me say exactly what it is. Um, so let's do it along here. Uh, I need to tell you uh, C of, so C0 of any one ball, uh, of any zero ball. Is just a singleton set containing that one rule. C1 of any interval is uh, the singleton set containing that interval, boring at the bottom. C2 of uh, some disk is uh, the collection of finite subsets of that disk uh, labeled by the, the, the simple object, with the points labeled by the simple objects of the, the modular tensor category. And um, C3 of some three ball. Well, I'm not going to tell you the entire set. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you bits and pieces of the set. So um, the set associated with this three ball is actually going to be a giant disjoint union of all the ways to label the boundary. And so let's, uh, I'll just tell you. Uh, set associated to the, the boundary label like that, well, this is just the vector space um, on back in the original modular tensor category of, uh, to, to, say, the tensor identity to, to the tensor product. Now, uh, you might say that that choice wasn't well defined, because I, I sort of wrote down in some particular order here. Um, whereas there wasn't an actual order of points on the boundary of the sphere, but of course all of the structure of the modular tensor category allows you to sort of do that in a coherent way, like take a section of all possible drugs and so on. And there we go, there's a just like three category. And all of the, the composition operations that we need, uh, we just pull up from composition and it's a down in the tensor category. And of course using the gradient as well to do that. Okay. Yeah, and then so I mean, as soon as you've, you've said all of this, I mean, what is this, this invariant here? Uh, it ends up just being uh, 
labeled ribbon graphs inside M, modular local relations in balls. And that's, of course, the vector space. So, not very much is going on here. It's just a sort of way of saying that, that captures lots of examples of this. Okay. So, we best do. Uh, when did it start? Oh dear. Okay. 40 uh, minutes ago. Okay. So, we're going to do Kamara from Olympia now. So, I'm just going to tell you Kamara from Olympia in basically the same way that I told you uh, how to build a three category from a modular offensive category. I'm just going to explicitly write down all the morphism spaces. So, here we go. Kn0 on a zero ball is a single thing set containing that zero ball. Kh1 on a new ball is a single thing set. Kh2 of a disk, a two disk, is the collection of finite subsets. They're labeled gold uh, of that disk. Now Kh3. At this point, I'm going to start using the convention I, I used up here. I'm going to tell you the set for this ball with the set of specified set of boundary conditions, and you have to take the different union of all boundary conditions. So the set associated with a free ball with a finite subset and a boundary is just the set of, uh, of embedded tangles in the free ball with those boundaries. And here I really mean just the full set of all the embedded tangles. There's no, there's no isotopy or anything like that. So it's some gigantic thing. And in K4, so now I'm going to tell you what I associate, the vector space that I associate to a full ball with specified boundary conditions. So what do boundary conditions look like? Well, it's some data on the boundary that on each three ball looks like a tangle that's just saying a link in the boundary. And I just declare this. Okay, so a few things to say. Here we, we really didn't do anything. We were just talking about <coughs> co-dimension two submanifolds. Uh, and if you ever read one of the uh, epic definitions of a of a graded tensor two category, um, you, you should you should sort of be thinking in terms of in those terms. We're really describing a graded tensor two category here. You can see that from the fact that we. We just did the, the simplest possible things about it. Okay, so what are the glue maps? Those are the morphisms of all different shapes. Well, given two balls. Sorry, uh, yep. KH4 seems to spit out the vector space, the other ones spit out the set. Uh, yep, okay, so as I was saying um, before, when you're, in, when you're enriching in some category, you only see that, that, that special enriching category at the top level. Here, I mean, the way to think of it is that KH4 of an undecorated four ball is some gigantic set that is a disjoint union over boundary conditions of vector spaces. So once I specify a boundary condition, I've got a vector space. But when I vary the, the boundary conditions, they're just, they're just vector spaces beside each other. Now you have a chain complex, so that this colon is a colon of chain complex. Okay. Um, let's do the more of groups now. Okay. okay. So how do I get the gluing maps here? Well, given two balls that I want to glue together, one of them is going to have a link that looks like T1 connects on T2, and the other one is going to have a link that looks like T2 connects on T3. These T2s are the bit of the link in the disk that we're gluing on. Okay? So we need a map uh, from KH, so the homology of T1 T2, tends to the homology groups of T2 connects on T3, to the homology groups of T1 connects on T3. Now, it turns out this is really easy. Anytime you have this situation, there's an obvious surface that has input the disjoint union of T1 connects on T2, T2 connects on T3, and ends up at T1 connects on T3. It just sort of cancels T2 against itself by a sequence of Radomeister 2 moves and, um, and Saturn moves. 
uh, maybe, I mean, let me draw a completely trivial example where all of the tangles are just arcs. You just do nothing on the outside tangles, just have the cylinders over those, and then have the cylinder over T2, but turned upside down. So this, this obvious cobordism here induces some map, and that's what we declared in the building map in the whole paper. Checking that, uh, checking the axioms, uh, which are still here, uh, is essentially just saying that Kaplan chronology is functional. The maps that we associate to surfaces only depend on that surface after isotopes. Okay. So we built a fork. Now, uh, there are some technical details in this, uh, which I, I will briefly tell you about, but maybe not right now. Um, notice that here, we had a link in S3, not a link in V3. And this really requires a little bit of new technology over what's in the literature for chromatochronology. The problem is that there is, a, uh, there is an isotopy very briefly, uh, of a link, where we take this string here, so T is just some tangle, and it's closed up on the right, we take this arc here and we swing it over the top, and then we swing it back over the behind. Okay? Now, in S3, this isotopy is isotopic to the identity. Okay? So if we want to work in Gravano from all in S3, we better have some guarantee that this chain map, which is of course a giant composition of random rights moves as we swing the arc behind the tangle, comes out to be And very sadly, uh, we only know how to prove that uh, in characteristic two, we're working in, in Z12, whereas chromatic homology really should work everywhere. Um, now, uh, this is very sad. Uh, some people in this audience will have seen me give talks where I claim stronger things. Some people in this audience have even pointed out in the questions at the end of the talk why my proofs were wrong. That this, Worked in general. So there's a sad aspect here. We have to do Kuvana from what we want to if we expect this to work. Okay. So what does this invariant look like? What does the format of this invariant look like that we get out of this four category coming from Kuvana? K of W4, some link in the boundary, span. By diagram the following form. So let me draw a. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's some big four manifold. Uh, here's some. Uh, here's some link in the boundary. Okay, so. This vector space is spanned by pictures of the following form. First of all, chop up the four manifold into balls, which obviously very schematically, like so. On the interfaces between balls, uh, pick some tangle uh, that sort of meets the other tangles at that interface. So let me draw. So this red line I've already drawn is part of the fixed boundary conditions for the vector space we're trying to construct. The next bits of red I'm going to draw are appear in each, in each element of this vector space. So let me draw a tangle here, maybe just a little arc with a, a hop link around it. And then finally, inside each of the balls that you've chopped up the manifold in, into an element of the Kravana homology of that link. Okay, so in this ball, we just see a trefoil connect some hop link some element of that vector space over here, we see some other link, we pick some element of that vector space. Okay, so it's spanned by diagrams of these forms, and then the, the curly in the definition just says that anytime you obtain such a diagram by gluing up some balls in some finite picture, you set them. Okay. So that's really the, the, the definition of the, of the invariant. And the question becomes, is there any vector ever computing this thing? Can we actually say anything about any form? So the first thing that you'd like to do is uh, 
into the machinery that you know that you always have uh, when you have a TQFT in the domain. Uh, and in particular, uh, whenever you have a, a TQFT invariant coming from an N category, it's, a, it's an extended TQFT. That is, it, it, uh, it tells you uh, what to associate to, to co-dimension manifolds as well, and it tells you how to, how to compute the invariant for a big manifold by chopping it up into pieces and then gluing together the results along those co-dimension manifolds. So maybe we should hope to, to just use that machinery. So certainly we know that we have W1 glued together on M3, W2. There's some formula saying this vector space is obtained to tensor product. Of some, uh, of some modules over some one category. So KH, so KH of a four manifold with some vector space. The TQFT machine can associate some one category with three manifold. Uh, four manifolds with M in their boundary become modules over that one category. So here is somewhat there's a module over M here and a module over M here. And the, the general gluing formula tells you you can compute pieces that tensor product. Okay, that's all very well. But this requires understanding.
So you get different functors here just because you have to, uh, uh, you have on the three different functors, you have different boundary conditions on this W. So you just, you end up associating different vector spaces here. But since you hear that, I mean, what is, remember what does this functor look like? On some ball decomposition, it's just a big tensor product of Kavana homologies. And if on the boundary the link differs in, in, in one little place, well, assume that all the ball decomposition you're looking at have a ball that sort of is big enough to surround that the crossing you're resolving, you immediately see that there's an exact triangle amongst these functors. You have to think about that. But, for the kernel of this So even though you have an exact triangle amongst the functors here, as soon as you take kernel of and get the TQFT invariant, you just lose everything. There's no, there's no longer any relationship between the vector spaces for the three different tangles. And uh, well, that's bad news. So what's the resolution of that? Well, the resolution is that we need something better than this prescription of the TQFT invariance uh, via the code. And what we propose doing is just taking that, that description I gave you of the invariant and replacing the code limit with homotopic code. Saying exactly what we mean by, by homotopic code. And it turns out you can do this, and you can do this in this complete generality. And given an, a dislike n category, you can, you can write homotopic code with instead of code and associate it to every n manifold now. You get some chain complex. And the original TQFT vector space invariant is just the zero homology of that chain complex. But now you've got all this higher stuff. Now that higher stuff is what we call the block complex. Um, and um, let me tell you let me tell you quickly what the block complex actually looks like and what the homotopic curve turns out like to be. So now for a uh, an M manifold and just like N category and can prepare for you some chain complex. So in particular, I need to tell you what the k-chains are. Here, uh, I'll think 
forget the outer blob in that term, and I'll forget the inner blob in that term. For all of these balls, we're going to have labels, and they just carry those labels over here. But then there's, there are other terms. Corresponding to all of the ways to erase, to forget an innermost blob, so a blob that has no more blobs inside of it, and at the same time gluing up its contents. Okay, so here there used to be two balls here, labeled with labeled by endomorphisms, and in this term we replaced the ball decomposition with a coarser one, with a single ball here, labeled by the composition of those two endomorphisms. Okay? Uh, you can check lots of wonderful properties of this, of this differential. d squared is zero, at least if you sprinkle signs appropriately, uh, and it's easy to check that the zero homology recovered exactly the covenant that we had in the first place. Okay. So this is explicitly what I mean by, by homotopic covenant instead of covenant. What does this do for me? Why? Why is this the right thing to do when you're working with categories that have exact triangles? I mean, quantum homology is very unlike the sort of examples that we were talking about otherwise. I mean, pivotal categories and modular tensor categories are, I mean, they're, they're, they're really the same simple in the world. And quantum homology is some strange triangle. And so it's maybe not so surprising that we need slightly different technology. But let me show you what you achieve with that slightly different technology. Okay. The exact sequences of boundary conditions give us a double complex. So here we go. So let's have V0 of K of this resolution. So that's the zero block group uh, using quantum homology for this four manifold with the with result like so. Here's V0 of K of this guy. Here's V0 of K. The other resolution. But this here, I mean, this isn't the co-limit, this is just the representatives of the co-limit. This was an exact construction. This, this row here is, is still along exact sequence. And now we've got the higher level groups as well. There's V1 here of K this, V1 of this guy, and V1 of K this guy. You have to think a little bit more now, but you realize that this construction here, associating the one block chains to a four manifold with some boundary condition, well, that's also an exact compass. We still have a long exact sequence along here. Okay? And now there are these differentials. Going down. Okay, so let's compute the, uh, the homology of the total complex. I've run out of time, so, so I won't write any more. I'll just say it. Uh, we compute the total complex in two different ways. You compute this way first, and everything vanishes. Okay? Uh, alternatively, you compute vertically first, and what do you get? Well, if you compute the differential, the vertical differential, you just get the blob homology groups. Okay? And so that tells us that there's some spectral sequence whose first page are all the blob groups. And in particular, on the bottom row are the the old-fashioned co-limit invariants of four manifolds sitting on the bottom. So that's the first page of the spectral sequence. And we know that it converges to zero, because we've got another way of computing the final page, doing the horizontal differential. And this gives you a whole lot of constraints between uh, the homology groups at the bottom here, the four manifold invariants you may be able to calculate. But along the way, you maybe need to work out some higher level groups as well, in order to, to see what you've got just on the ordinary co-limit down on the bottom. But I think this is the sort of gag that might lead you to computations, the amount of the four manifolds. I can't do those computations, but this is the sort of thing you should look for. For the manifold invariants coming from categories with triangular Okay, thank you.